I know you as podcaster, as documentarian, as philosopher, as facilitator, as narratologist, um, as Ian McKenzie, and also as the brains behind the School of the Poetics. So I think I will let I will begin there and let you flesh out that um, description. Okay. okay, nice to be here, Sophie. Nice to be uh, on this side of the conversational equation um, hosted by you and um, yeah, in this container. Uh, yeah, I, I had never heard the word neurologist, I think you said. Neurotologist, I think. Neurotologist. Yeah, uh, I like that. Yeah, I mean. Uh, the shapes of stories, yeah. Okay, beautiful. I would say, and also welcomes everyone here who's, who's tuning in with us live. I would say that my work is concerned mostly with um, finding these threads of the emergent culture, right? No matter where they are from, you know, years at Burning Man to Occupy Wall Street. Uh, and at one point I was inspired to try to illuminate this, I, I call it this, this mimetic rise, <clears throat> rise of the feminine. And, and I didn't understand what that meant really at the time. And ultimately it was shaped through collaborations with my co-director, Nicole Sorkin and many others, uh, a project that examined the feminine, um, uh, through the lives of female DJs and producers mostly, um, and, and used a mythic lens. And so it was natural through that process that I was drawn to then look at masculinity through the same lens because I had realized largely too, because of the way that I'd grown up in the absence of a lot of this mythological context that I was drawn to that. And I discovered the whole mythopoetic men's movement and beyond and started the mythic masculine. So there's all these threads that, you know, have, have sort of just called to me and, and ultimately, yeah, I, I guess I see myself as a, as an amplifier of the kind of cultural shifts that, I wish to see, uh, you know, generative, generatively contributing to this time, and the mediums can change whether it's film, writing, uh, yeah, podcasting, things like that. But ultimately, I feel like that's my that's my mission. Yeah, I see you as embodying a very kind of mycelial sensibility. Of course, you know, not thinking of fungi as a monolith, but thinking very specifically about mycorrhizal fungi and how they, you know, they create ecosystems, they connect, you know, disparate nodes of, of the forest together and how you've been really ex expert at, you know, connecting me with people who I would have never expected to collaborate with and um, creating um, a landscape of conversation rather than a monomyth. So, you know, I see you as, as really acting like a mycorrhizal fungi in the work that you do, whatever medium you take, you know, as mm. your, um, you know, your direction. Um, I do have a question, which is because we're, you know, the topic of this conversation is conceivably about masculinity. Um, and I wanted to ask, when you were growing up, what was your experience of the masculine narratives offered to you? Which ones appealed to you? Which ones felt constricting? How did you navigate that um, narrative um, ecosystem? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for this. Um, as I reflect, you know, it really becomes more clear to me that the absence of any any mythological context was offered it was more the inverse right like, like what you what yeah. picked up through osmosis uh through pop culture through models of masculinity that were around you know my father uh other older men um there was this sense of just simply you know, from modeling it was it was never presented as a kind of cultural framework right of you know here's when you enter the initiation you know context from childhood to adult and like here's the myths that are are given to me at this time for example that i understand more intact cultures do have these kinds of frameworks yeah. that there's 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 a guiding context of um that's that's more apparent uh than essentially you know picking up in its absence so certainly you know i grew up uh you know 80s late 80s you know sort of early teens and then into the 90s and some of the tropes were certainly there um you know often the the strong you know, dominant man, action hero, you know, kind of elements there, the stoic masculine doesn't feel much, but gets things done. You know, these kinds of things were apparent, but also blending with a, a kind of softer masculinity, um, a more yeah, gentle, a more pleasing um, kind of masculinity that, you know, I, certainly I think are still in a lot of tension today, but um, I would say, yeah, I didn't have a, a, a real clear sense, right? Of what does it mean? Uh, had to discover it uh, personally, like I think so many other men do. 
Yeah, and so you mentioned discovering the mythopoetic men's movement, and I'm wondering how, where, what intersection you see between myth making and then self identification and gender, um, and and in what how that has has fruited in your own um, life in your own self identification. Mm -hmm. Well, it was uh, 2015 when I came across the book Iron John. Yeah. And those folks that, you know, have heard of this, it's sort of the mythopoetic foundational text for at least the Robert Bly um, inspired, you know, wave of, of the mythopoetic men's movement. And certainly his teachers um, influenced him. Mm -hmm. uh, and and the, essentially the use of story, in this case, a myth of Iron John, Iron Hans, I uh, believe in the sort of initial German or sort of Bavarian um, um, place based understanding. And that he used that myth to illuminate the the experience of men at the time, largely, you know, sort of late 80s again into the early 90s. And reading that myth, there's something that many men, I think, experienced, and I did too, was, I mean, it certainly was also through his commentary that was able to make these kinds of connections. But it was so deeply illuminating to my own experience uh, as a man in this culture that it was a it was a profound like sense of being seen, right? Uh, which had been, never really happened. I had never really had that experience before. And so on the one hand, it was a feeling of of yeah, being seen and being recognized at, for having a certain kind of experience and challenges in in growing up and with masculinity, but then also a sense of, oh, wow, so so many other men are experiencing this, then there is something that is actually transpersonal, right? Like if so many men growing up in a certain context can recognize or find value in, a myth, then there's something beyond, you know, just preference. And so whether that is just the fact that we share a certain experience growing up presenting masculine right in the culture, or that there is some kind of relationship to, I don't know, biology or, or um, sort of, I mean, I'm thinking of another um, guest I had on that spoke to masculinity as a theatrical spirit, right? Like that there is some there is something recognizable that is beyond simply <clears throat> individual preference, right? At least that was mirrored back to me when I had that uh, experience with the book. And so uh, just just having a, an overt um, relationship to a myth and to my story, again, was was a profound uh, sense of possibility for me. And, and again, for other men that ultimately, you know, that wave crested and now it's in, some, <clears throat> in a renaissance. And of course, the work you do as well is, I think, Again, a conscious application of myth. Haven't read the book yet, but I'm very much looking forward to it, by the way, Sophie. Um, and what I've tried to do in the Masculine podcast as well, right, is again, illuminate, um, I think you've used the word polyphony of, yeah. uh, of narratives in the past, right, to to, to bridge the, the ecosystem of actually more um, ways of experiencing and exploring, in this case, masculinity. Yeah, I think because because masculinity has been so conflated with patriarchy and because patriarchy has infiltrated, you know, on the wave of colonialism, so many different corners of the earth, it's very easy to think of it's always been here. But I, you know, as I was doing this work into looking back into the, you know, the deep time history of the masculine, um, you know, we're actually embraced, I think, on either side by alternatives, you know, it, it just, it, as recent as 5,000 years ago, we have much, we, it's not that even we, it's not that we even have a healthier mode of the masculine, it's that we have a biodiversity, a polyphony, as you um, recall, which is many different songs, some discordant, some harmonic, all composing a complex musical ecosystem. And I also think that in the future, we're moving towards that kind of caucus you know, when you think of a tree that you cut back and then it, it pullers out into like six different stems, I think we're diverging right now into many different options, um, a biodiversity of expressions, um, so that we can begin to think of patriarchy not as being like this monolithic um, obstruction that's always been here, but as being like a blip that we can look backwards and see like the rhizomatic, um, diffusion of many different possibilities and then look to the future and see our hyphy branching out as we see this little thing behind us, this little hyphy, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, into many different possibilities. So I've been trying to think of like time as being an embrace for the masculine um, and the present moment as being not a not the only state we've ever been in. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I recall just to speak to a more 
yeah, personal story recently as well. I attended a gathering uh, a few weeks ago. This mm -hmm. is on an island close by to me. It was put on by a friend who brought in some uh, trainers, facilitators from, I believe, Oregon. Uh, essentially, they they create uh, mentorship training, right? So in this case, for men to mentor, to, to train yeah. in how to mentor younger men. And so the frame of it, though, was actually called the inner mentor training because that they they presented this sense that before one is able to you know, authentically mentor, be in a mentorship role with youngers, in this case, younger men, that there needs to be work done, of course, to, to reconnect to, you know, enough of yourself that you don't project, you know, stuff on that younger person or uh, try to get, you know, needs met that you didn't get when you were a teen that are like showing up. And it's, it's funny how much actually shows up, uh, you know, in recognizing this intergenerational um, touch points. And one of the things that came up for me in, in when they presented the material was they spoke a lot about this idea of, well, really presenting a kind of what not to do scenarios mm -hmm. around, in this case, mentoring young men. And and it probably works in, you know, mentoring any young folk. But this idea of, you know, trying to fix them, uh, you know, I don't know, arguing, telling them they're wrong, judgment, right? All of these ways in which uh, coercion, you know, these ways in, you know, sort of parenting often this can show up. But um, what I saw, and then in the alternatives, the what was presented was presence, you know, curiosity, um, being with, like all of these things that create the the kind of contact, the kind of relationship and where mentoring can happen authentically, right? It's not something that's like being done to, you know, to the younger, I'm going to mentor you now. It's actually just presence and curiosity often are these gateways and true contact can occur. And, you know, this language wasn't used uh, in the materials that was presented, but I couldn't help but seeing the lens presented by Rianne Eisler, of course, in her book, Chalice and the Blade. Yeah. We talked about dominator culture versus partnership culture. Yeah. yeah. And it was so clear to me when I was looking at these materials, I was like, oh, yeah, this is a paradigm of domination. I mean, i.e. how we use interchangeably often now with patriarchy. Uh, and this is a paradigm of partnership, like of, of real contact, of actually you know, being curious. And, you know, we could also, we could also throw in, you know, modern industrial civilization and the insane pace of, uh, you know, efficiency or, um, yeah. you know, more, which is such the enemy of all of the qualities that actually um, provide the space for human you know, true connection, um, true feeling, right? Like the, one of the things that it spoke to was, you know, this idea of essentially spanking, just spanking work, right? In terms of creating, behavioral shifts. Uh, and the the comment that was made was, well, it does work, you know, in heavy quotations, it works, but um, does it work that well? Like, does somebody who's basically afraid of being dominated, do that, does that actually engender the kind of behavioral authenticity, you know, of wanting to, you know, be a good person or, or do the right, the right thing, whatever it is. Sure, it works based on fear, maybe, and, um, you know, the the consequence in a way, but other ways work better, actually, you know, time in, uh, yeah, curiosity, getting to the root of certain behaviors. But it takes, this is why I go back to this word time. It takes way more time, actually, to do these things, right? It takes way more presence yeah. uh, in a way, way more effort. And those things are actually, you know, completely opposite to a lot of the momentum, right, of the dominant culture. And so I'll just say one last thing about what I see in this arc of shifting from, you know, a culture of domination and efficiency and go um, is this call for yeah, presence, receptivity, um, you know, deep feeling. Uh, this is one of the main kind of key mantras, right, for men doing, quote, men's work, right, is really developing the deep capacity to feel deeply again. Um, and, of course, then it butts into all of the qualities of, you know, typical masculinity, but of strength, of, of competition, you know, all these things that also, you know, it, it, they can't be lost along the way either because then you have, you know, you sort of lose these other um uh, values or powers right of masculinity let's say that also you know are really important to a culture so you know i just see all of these things are jostling for some kind of new universalism right i mean hopefully not but some kind of dynamic uh palette perhaps that uh can be can be at the ready right for uh, as we navigate this moment yeah toolbox it's so interesting i i, I sense a, a like a larger theme coming up in what you're talking about with things i'm massaging in my work about trauma and illness with someone who has an incurable genetic illness and who has, you know, PTSD. And I think that, you know, we're in such a solutionist culture 
and, and, and solutions are always, we always want to grab the easiest, fastest one. Efficiency is always prized in any, you know, be it, you know, men's work, be it healing. And we, we lose a lot and we actually, we end up doing more damage ultimately. Like you spank the child and maybe they listen to you that day, but then they act out later in life. You know, we, we do something upstream and it affects, you know, a whole flow. Um, and, you know, a friend of mine who's also a, um, participating in this course, Jessica Dory, was talking about the difference between like trying to fix someone and then giving them presence and accompaniment. And that really, I, I heard that in what you were talking about with mentorship, which is it's not about trying to change someone. It's about walking alongside them. And we know from, you know, a lot of, you know, actual science that when we're walking alongside someone, we begin to mirror neuron with them. We begin to actually come into regulation. We start to walk with each other and each person brings the other person into a more balanced state. And I was thinking about how you know, that's a kind of partnership model rather than a dominator model where you're trying to force someone to come into your precise physical experience. Rather, you're meeting in some kind of um, collaborative homeostasis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's beautiful. I think that 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 is both, yeah, the practice, I feel, and also you know, demonstrating models of masculinity that, that have that range. Right. And, and, um, you know, I never saw when I was younger, a group of men authentically relating to each other. Yeah. I'll just get like that. Right. Like I never saw that, which is again, bizarre to me now that, uh, the amount of spaces I exist in now, uh, you know, hopefully my son sees, maybe doesn't understand. I have a son who's right. He's about four now, Yeah. but the, the amount of the way he sees, you know, just, picks up on things right to say like oh wow you know that's that's also in the range of how adults are or how men can be together right that's also in there i just think that that has an effect beyond a kind of uh you know later stage uh imposition right that that has to happen has to happen over time to really take root i think in in a way of being uh that you know i'm i'm banking on i suppose for for my son certainly yeah, I and mean, I also have a question, which is, so you did this incredible project called The Mythic Masculine. If people watching haven't listened to it, it was a series of interviews you did with people from many, many different backgrounds and gender expressions about what masculinity means. I was a guest, but I also listened yeah. to pretty much every episode and found it to be one of the only examples of a masculine um, interrogation that didn't try and settle on one answer that it lived the question, that it mulched the ground rather than sterilizing it and creating like a monocrop. And I, I guess my question is, what were you surprised by at the end of that experience? Like what expectations did you go in with and what surprised you most about the inquiry? What did you learn? What, what did you change your mind about? Yeah, thanks for that. And I'll just add a little thing too, that it's not fully composted yet yeah. uh, in terms of completion i actually have a couple i mean it's been quiet on, for a while which is i think is a natural way of the ebb right of realizing oh I've, i arrived somewhere right within that experience or within that inquiry and that i thought okay now is the time to just you know let it rest yeah. for a bit and um, i'm grateful to say actually that there's a couple of really amazing ones episodes coming out oh, but um, yeah but i can say that uh going in i think i mean the intention was one uh, uh, just uh, like you said to to lean into that question, right? From but from a mythic lens, myth, mythopoetic lens. Uh, I was wanting to bridge the generations of the previous mythopoetic wave. Yeah. Uh, people like Michael Mead, other folks that that were really at the epicenter, and then speak to now this current moment because it did feel like it was coming through a resurgence. Mm -hmm. But also again to bring in lots of voices that weren't included, uh, you know, in that in that inquiry in the past or in that um, gathering in the past. And so, I would say if one of the most significant kind of uh touch points or, or yeah like maps of the terrain that came forth or the tapestry i think one was again just how just how dangerous or not maybe not dangerous not quite the right word but how um seductive it is to try to supplant a universal with another universal mm -hmm. yeah right and and by that even universal could be everybody decides what they are right like that's ultimately the best outcome and the, you know without a kind of faithful willingness to you know not just toss everything out i think sometimes it can head that way right it can just say that's all there is it's just personal preference and it's like whoa, whoa wait a second you know there are 
what I've discerned, at least from many guests, there are these like patterns, if or you want to call them, you know, emergent from the collective unconscious or wherever that do have sway into how they organize uh, human experience in human societies. So there's something in that. And oftentimes that would come, I guess what I'm saying is the, the, the calls for a sort of a universalist response, at least my recollection never came from those rooted in a, their own cultures mm -hmm. yeah it never came from the indigenous folks saying yeah yeah just toss it all out like that wouldn't that never seem to happen they would just say well this is what we do right well this is what we do so it's like okay there's a there's a real humility there of well you know this is how it works for us or how it has worked or what it's it, not that it stayed the same either but there's a sense that well this is what we do so there basically there wasn't there didn't seem to be a strong impulse to try to universalize the way that they were doing things. Now, that's really important, again, I think, to highlight because, you know, to a universalist, irradiated mind, a universal response seems like the antidote, uh, but not understanding it to be universalist, right? So that, yeah. that has been a major inquiry. You want to speak to that? No, it's just something I've been thinking about a lot, which is I was reading an incredible essay from a book that I really recommend called Death by Landscape by Elvia Wilk about universalism and how universalism is always a fiction. It's always going to be a violence to something else that whenever it's always, a you know, this is my expansion of that, but it's always a colonial enterprise. It's always taking one type of wisdom and then trying to disseminate it to many different ecosystems and cultures and pretending like it could possibly thrive. And yeah, so it, I've just, I've been really thinking about how to prob problematize this movement towards universalism that we're seeing like, in the realm of animism and the psychedelic renaissance and are all sorts of um, kind of ecological realms that are, I think, have good intentions, but can actually rearticulate the very systems they're trying to um, oppose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I the way I see it is universalism is is, is a monotheism. I yeah, mean, it's exactly. Of, you know, it's, like, it's like the Russian doll, or, you know, you put, take it out yeah. and you're like, oh, that, there it is. Uh, and so it, basically, the way I understand too, and this is some, you know, drawing from my time with uh, my main, one of my main teachers, Stephen Jenkinson, yeah. but just the sense that uh, he has this phrasing, which is, it always gets me, but it's uh, first generation trauma, second generation God. And, you know, there's a detonation there if you, if you really kind of yeah. can, can hold that, but the yeah. sense that the first, the first generation experiences the trauma, but because it's so traumatic and, and can't be like lived, it ends up often in the next generation being deified. Yeah, no, I mean this 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 is totally holds up in all of my research. I you know I read a lot about Second Temple period Palestine and the movement from pantheism to, to mm -hmm. um, monotheism. And I really you see the dislocation of people from their ecosystems. You see mass climatological um, pressures. You know volcanic eruptions during the end of the Bronze Age and trauma that you know was not sacred to people that was absolutely meaning extinguishing probably. Um, and then of course, a couple generations down the line, you get this mass cultural somatic response, which is the disassociation of mind and matter. You get pl uh, Platonism, um, which then of course gets rearticulated by Christian theology and then by Cartesian dualism. And it's interesting to see that it, it gets it gets accepted as rationalism, as, as intellect, but it began as trauma. Um, yeah. Mm, beautiful. I love that. Threads. Uh, so I can just visualize yeah, the other waves of like each generation. It's like takes on a different form, but it's the same ripple. You know, yeah. kind of rippling I, up from the epicenter. I think it, but I also think what it does is it gives us empathy, which is, you know, you, we can be empathic with ourselves about survival mechanisms. And cultures need survival mechanisms to, you know, you know, it, to survive being exiled, being genocidally oppressed, experiencing incredible, you know, volcanic eruptions. They need ways to make meaning. So we can be empathic about that. Just as personally, when we're to experience violence, we need to find ways to correct. But we can also understand that it's not always, it's not sustainable. It's not always healthy. Um, yeah. And I do think, I think that we there's such a, you know, people have experienced a lot of violence and it's very easy to point the finger at men. You know, that was, I think for me for a long time, I didn't, you know, I like hid in the divine feminine. And, but then I realized that all my favorite people were men. And I wasn't <laughs> going to change the story. I, I, I wasn't going to create 
more interesting conversations if I didn't involve men in them and start to look at those myths and have empathy. And so I'm kind of I'm wondering what role empathy plays, be it between human beings and also between beings, humans and more than humans, plays in your work and your thinking. Mm. The role of empathy. Yeah. 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 I mean, there's a couple of threads there too. Uh, I mean, maybe to finalize the last conversation thread too is that yeah. I basically what I see is all of the conversations that that I was having um, were either close to that epicenter or you might say the crater yeah. of the loss of culture yeah right or or not so they were basically hovering to various degrees of unable to speak to to that uh black hole i'll call it and uh you know i wrote a piece a little while ago around essentially so much of what we see as the the maladies of the time and the culture and and the individual personifications of that depression you know all these things there one way to see it is it's like light bending around a black hole you know when you look at the stars my understanding is that maybe that's changed i don't know but that astronomers can't see black holes right like you can't you can't perceive the black hole directly but you can see how light is bending around it yeah right and then you can infer oh this is where black hole is and so this is how i now see so much of the afflictions of the time or even like toxic masculinity um is is not i don't understand it to be a thing versus it's the light bending around the thing that already happened that's beautiful right. yeah i mean the, the hyper ob object of our extractive eurocentric culture like whatever it is it's impossible to locate or see like timothy morgan comes up with the idea of like these like climate change is a hyper object these things that we can't you know put on a piece of paper and say that's its shape um but yeah i love that idea that all of these things are symptomatic rather than being the root. Yeah. And that, I mean, that plays into, again, the, the understanding of therefore, quote, what do we do about it? Because, yeah. uh, you know, if, if masculinity is practiced within an absence of that understanding, or what I say, you know, men's work or, or trying to approach the problem of toxic yeah. masculinity, then it's not, it's like trying to mold individuals within a system that is constantly trying to mold them a different way. Yeah, and then you throw them back onto the system that punishes them for the work they've done. I think about that also in terms of our healthcare system, which is you are you become sick by virtue of these like entangled systems of oppression that sediment in your body. You go in, they give you a medicine to like make you a better worker, and then you go back out to get sick again. Like, what role is medicine playing? What role is men's work playing if it's only treating the symptoms and then throwing yeah. you back out into the dirty the dirty sea? Yeah. Yeah. Well, this also is, again, the, the kind of intersection, I'd say, or the, the kind of inevitable confrontation. If if men's work is doing its job, it will yeah. lead men to confront the systems huh. of oppression, of, of uh, domination. Right. That that that's to me, unless that's happening, then it's still just circling around this idea of personal growth, you know, self-achievement, yeah. this kind of stuff. So it, 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 that's really a sort of a litmus test, actually. Does it point the men doing the work towards Bigger. actually confronting the system? Yeah. yeah. Um, it's interesting because, you know, I, I've watched as you've been very involved with Fairy Creek and protecting the trees there. Would you think that work like that is kind of part of, part of your men's work, that this kind of environmentalism and men's work can become interconnected? Yeah. Yeah. And I'll say too that, you know, I, I, I did a few short films uh, with another yeah. organization called Mama's Movement to help, again, bring awareness. I visited Fairy Creek as well. I interviewed one of the main activists that was there uh, named Shambu and um, interviewed some of the elders that were there. And so, you know, I tried to bring a bit of my media um, amplification. And more, most recently, a few weeks ago, I interviewed Rainbow Eyes, who's a indigenous activist that was very involved until basically the courts ordered her not to go back which is again, it's just a wild uh, situation. But um, what my, you know, I, I have this image too of like, imagine, you know, like there's this, uh, there's men's groups all over the place now, right? And imagine that there was this um, deep recognition and a rallying cry for those folks, you know, running these groups to say, wait a second. Okay, yes, you know, we gotta, you know, connect with our wild man. We gotta, you know, be high achievers in our own life and, and you know, bring value to our families. Yes. and there's a situation here that actually needs us, right? There's a situation here. These trees are being cut down, these great mother trees. And that's actually more important in this moment 
to abdicate from, you know, job for a couple of days or a weekend or whatever, and all come there and imagine, like, imagine that visual image, right? I just see of all these men who come to be in service, right? Real service, not Instagram service, but real service to confront these very systems. That, that to me would be a, a real marker of like, wow, they're actually doing the work. Like these groups are oriented to what's actually needed instead of orbiting, once again, the self-growth paradigm endlessly. Yeah, no, it's so interesting for me because I've been thinking a lot about conversations about gender and self-identification and how they oftentimes feel like rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic as, you know, these much bigger um, multi-species webs begin to fray. And like, how can we look to healing and, you know, self, like self-work as being on a rhizome with all these other creatures? You know, maybe our healing isn't inside of our body. Maybe it's in you know, healing a forest, healing a place, protecting a field of like invasive species or not invasive species, but well, you know, I'm pro-invasive species because I think they're very complicated and interesting. I know that's like a radical thing to say, but, you know, I, I was thinking of like the monarchs that the, uh, there's been this huge um, effort to, to grow up your lawns and, you know, try and give them a place to live. And that can be a kind of healing for you, even if you aren't quote unquote doing self work. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, it, it really just for me, it looks at the question too of what, what does it take to actually change yeah. the context? Right. Because, you know, if I, if I get, I, I think it might have been Bio Akomalafa who spoke about this idea of masculinity as a strategy. Right? Uh, yeah. And, and I could even say, yeah, femininity is a strategy. Um, even now, non binary could be a strategy. Queer is a strategy. The sense that um, within a certain context, then, yeah, certain yeah. things are valued, certain incentives are present. Uh, and so again, it's like how to shift the context whereby certain other values can come forward. I mean, I did a film years ago around Charles Eisenstein's book, Sacred Economics. Yeah. And it's still one of the most viewed films I've ever done. It's, you know, it's very short, it's 12 minutes, you can find it online. But for me, like the core transmission of that was relocating this idea of misanthropy which was actually at so much of the base of so much activism today. Yeah. Right? It's, it's sort of an un, un, sort of unannounced mis misanthropy, really a sort of cynicism around humans, right? What's, what are the it's values? It's actually kind of self-centering because suddenly- well, <laughs> Exactly, all of a sudden it's like, well, humans, you know, what are you gonna do? Mm -hmm. And uh, and so what I recognize through that film and at least Charles, you know, articulated well was, okay, look, you know, so much of human nature is, is not universal, greedy, you know, like, uh, um, I don't know, domineering, whatever it is, but it, within a certain paradigm, it's like those things are incentivized and those are, they're valued. And so yeah. it's, it's, you know, we have to be able to separate behaviors from the context because in a different context, like if I go to a place like, I mean, I'll just use the example of Tamara, which is a you know research center in yeah. Portugal, spent a number of years uh, going back there. Um, and, and now of course doing a film about it. But for me, the kinds of behaviors that were incentivized within that context, and also I say, when I hear about other stories from other indigenous cultures, they're just utterly different responses are actually the, the ones that continually show up because, you know, there's not a, this undercurrent of fear or coercion or, or lack, lack of belonging, right? All these qualities that humans so deeply need and desire, um, but they have a cultural context where they can live those out continuously, ceremony, ritual, um, all these beautiful ways, right? And it was like, we have to do that often in a, in a culturalist place, you know, you have to create those things kind of artificially on the weekend or, you know, like on a workshop. And so, you know, I don't say this to say, wow, look how far we've, we've fallen. There's no hope, but it's like, unless you deeply understand the nature of quote, the problem, right. We'll see, we'll keep responding to it in ways that don't actually change anything. Yeah. You know, thinking about the problem as part of the problem, um, you know, to kind of paraphrase bios, wisdom um yeah and I've, I've been really interested in the extended mind and how we've conflated brains and minds but our you know our minds extend past our body and the way we think is oftentimes you know we we store our memories and landscapes they're ways that we don't we, we don't remember certain things because we've offloaded them <laughs> into places you know we think better in rooms full of light with greenery we think better when we're moving we think better when we're talking to other people um and that, you know, our thinking doesn't even happen inside of our brains. We're these contexts, we're both context sensitive and we're also ontologically born out of our, our context, that we, we, we don't even exist without them. 
Um, and that maybe the, you know, the change isn't going to happen inside of this, you know, fictional atomized self, but it's going to happen in building these, you know, containers, these places, these landscapes where that require better behavior from us. Um, and I think that's interesting to think of ourselves as gardeners needing to create these communities and these places to grow rather than always thinking about it as being a solitary solipsistic effort. Mm -hmm. Well, this, yeah, I mean, this goes to really the heart of, I mean, you know, for me, I'd say it's ground zero for the work of the, the threads that I've tracked and trailed and not yeah. just me, of course, but, you know, essentially for me, the task ahead is how do we reassemble ourselves in social contexts that are back in relationship yeah with with each other with the more than human um with the divine right in ways that um you know the the phrase village comes up a lot right and of course this next version to revillage right as a verb and so you know again that might conjure some kind of hokey uh you know medieval peasantry or something i mean who knows depending on where you know peak oil and all that stuff's going but really though how do we assemble once again you know, from everything we've learned from, you know, the, the way there's technology that allows certain kinds of coherence, yeah. coherent shapes and patterns to emerge. You know, I'm curious about that. Um, you know, I think that there, obviously technology can be very double edged and has been and and is not neutral in that sense, I don't believe. But for me, like that's the core question is like, what does it mean to live in a coherent way in relationship uh, now? And it goes back to your question of empathy um, that you brought up earlier, which you know, um, bringing up Tamara again, the community in Portugal, they yeah. have a principle, they have a principle called uh, contact, mm -hmm. which um, I don't, I don't know if they originated it, but they certainly live it, <clears throat> which is this sense of it's, it's, it's more than just like a idea. It's a, it's an ongoing value and practice of what does it mean to be in contact, right? Contact with each other, contact with oneself, with the land. And in some ways it's essentially the, the initial stage before anything you know, wise, let's say, can happen or anything of, of um, benefit in a sense can happen. And how that might look, for example, is, you know, before going and, I don't know, chopping down a tree, right? Like you might, you might go to it first and actually make contact with that place, right? And like tune in and say, hey, you know, I've, uh, you know, we're, we're trying to make way for this place here, you know, to build this, you know, structure that is a value to the community. And I don't know what it is, right? There, there's some kind of uh, relationship attempted and, and cultivated, but not just shown up with an axe and away we go. But uh, also, for example, even with each other, that you know, before decisions are arrived in the community, often there's place made and time made to be in contact and to you know say, okay, whatever, what, how do people feel about this? You know, what if we took this choice or this choice? Um, and it's a real deep dedication to to this as a as a life way, which for me again comes back to this principle of um, co coherence and then emergence, right? That, uh, in a domination culture, you're constantly incoherent with the signals and the, uh, relationships. I mean, of course that, that basically animate the whole thing, right? Sort of famously that, you know, the more that the ecosystem gets destroyed, the more all the invisible ways in which we've been supported, you know, start to become apparent of like, oh, wow, like yeah. all of these, you know, yeah. Ecosystem, you know, cleaning, uh, uh, systems that were in place or how that species related to that species. And that therefore that meant that this plant grew or whatever it was, you know, as, as that, ho that is hollowed out, it becomes really clear of, whoa, how dependent we are on all these other, you know, multitudes of relationships and a domination culture can't see that, right. Cause they only see their ways of enacting uh, force on the system. And of course the consequence of that. And so there ends up being a real waste of energy um, just from a, systems perspective, I think, right? It's like moving with the energy of life and its movement of life, we start to tap into a kind of um, dynamic dance, right? Where it's like, oh, I mean, a permaculture, that's how I understand it, right? It's like a, it's an actual entrainment to the movements of how life wants to be and then like uh, pairing with it, right? Whereas domination culture is completely oblivious and is constantly imposing itself uh, to, you know, real consequence. Yeah, it goes back to what we were talking about with mentorship and accompaniment rather than trying to always solve or clean up or like, a, you know, create the a fictional idea of a climactic ecosystem rather asking it what it wants. What it seems that you're suggesting, and this seems to be something I'm coming to too, is a shift in temporality. Because when you have to make contact, suddenly everything dilates. 
every, you know, I thought about that in my life is, you know, there was a moment where I was like, I need to start really, really talking to every being I know in my area before I do anything. Like I need to go to the mountain and ask it if I can climb it before I can climb it. I, and it slowed my life down. It was burdensome, but it also, as it slowed my life down, I could see through cracks into, you know, side routes and um, meanders in my life that I would have never encountered if I was moving at the speed of anthropocentrism and efficiency. Um, so yeah, contact actually seems to be a way, it's, it's a way of enchaining, you know, mycorrhizal systems stitching together. You know, every time you make contact, you're creating a node of cognition and a great web, multi-species web. What you're, what you're also doing is your, um, hmm, I kind of lost my train, I'm trying to think about how to explain this. You're creating a web of, of beings that you can always tap into all the time. Like every time you make a choice, you can go back to that tree. You can go back to that mountain, to that assemblage of people and call them in as part of your like super cellular network of cognition. But you're also slowing down the speed at which we're destroying the earth. <laughs> like It's just a way of keeping us from doing. I oftentimes think that we're so based on a kind of techno narcissism that we're going to be able to fix this and understand how to fix this. And probably the most radical thing we could do is just to do less or to move slower. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, a couple of things come up. One is, you know, the pandemic certainly was yeah. this sort of imposition of slowness, right. On, on the movement of the Anthropocene. And, you know, there's some, you know, grace or, or light skies, literally, I think over Kathmandu or, you know, these places where you hear that the, smoke you know the smog yeah. cleared in some of these cities and suddenly they could see the mountains and yeah dolphins were you know up vienna canals or something i don't know exactly all this stuff but it was this life was a bit like oh you could breathe a little more again for a moment and there was like a glimpse of something just really uh impossible to see when you're moving too fast right yeah. like that's part of this this pace i want to bring up another example too though of contact even in say you know intergender relations and i think that um so much of the trespass of uh and i'll just use example here with men and women which was catalyzed i think or crystallized certainly by the me too uh you know uprising was or is that when contact is not present that's when trespass happens right that's because, interesting huh yeah because it becomes an imposition on this other being who actually right maybe like I, like for me this this is about what safety is right and in, in lots of different contexts uh, and safety and trauma, like what is that? And, you know, I'm leaping around a bit here, but if you can follow me for a second, that uh, back in, I think it was 20, yeah, 2017, I was in a head on collision. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, I was, I was parked, my friend was driving, we were just parked at a light and the car ahead of us uh, just, you know, shifted lanes into our lane and then just gunned it for us. It was, you know, and there was a moment I had just to say, like, wait, is that car, you know, coming yeah. right at us? Is, and then all of a sudden, boom. Right. And, you know, there was a moment of just complete oblivion. And all of a sudden, you know, I could smell uh, the smoke from the um, the airbag deployment and, you know, horns and and other, you know, yelling. And, so, and of course, for a moment, I was like, whoa, am I actually here? Am I a ghost? Yeah. But but then, of course, it, you know, I sort of came to of like, wow, yes, I'm still here. You know, nothing's broken, thankfully. And, you know, my friend was OK. Um, but I'll just say that there was something that lodged in me of this sense of what is the uh, like quality of of something traumatic and is that when you say like enough or no more or over done you know like when you set a boundary and that's crossed to me like that's that's how trauma happens right but i mean whether it's explicit or implicit in this case you know a physical trauma of like a, a car literally hurtling you know over my sense of my own boundaries uh and and the physical shock of that of course and uh you know, the lodge trauma from something like that. And then of course, in other situations in, you know, erotic encounters or any of these things where of course, like that's really seems like the definition of rape is when essentially that they're, they use the term consent often, right? Um, that that's the marker. Is there, was there consent? No, then therefore, of course it was a trespassing position, which is true. And I think at a deeper level, contact is, if, if contact's there, it's impossible to trespass. That's, I guess what I would say. Right. Because if no. you're in contact with another being, yeah, like you're aware and that you're aware of them. Right. And if they know themselves, that's the other piece. Right. Yeah. Because sometimes people say yes to things, even though they don't want to. Right. Um, maybe there's a situation that feels unsafe or dangerous. 
you know, this kind of stuff, right? But if they know and you're in contact, right, it's like there would never be trespass is, is what I've sort of arrived at. It's interesting that you use the the story of, of cars too, because it has a lot to do with speed um, and temporality as well, which is like, if you guys were walking, head on collision never happens. That in some ways, contact is peripatetic, it's bipedal, it's, it's, it's a, a walking pace, it's at the speed of life, um, not the speed of cars. You know, cars are always gonna create trauma because they're, they're always gonna run over animals and hurt things because they're moving too fast, that can never make contact. So of course they're gonna, you know, hurt other people as well. Um, I think that whenever I'm driving, which is like, I am not moving at the speed of life. Um, I'm arriving somewhere in a very artificial way. Um, and so how can we, I think walking, I actually, if I think about contact in my own life, walking was a way of, you know, I think I had this as a child and growing up and my parents were really, you know, they were kind of feral animists. <laughs> but, I, you know, the culture kind of, it blocks it out. It takes it away from you. It, it, it says it's, it's, you know, not the correct way to be. And I think for me, when I started to walk again, when I quit smoking, when I was 19, no, 20, um, I would walk like 20 miles a day. It was this slowing down where I like had to make contact with every being, every squirrel, every animal that had been hit by a car that was dying that I would walk past, wow. that my life suddenly like opened up and created texture. And I realized that I had to get consent from places because I couldn't just speed past them. So I think about cars as being actually a really interesting metaphor for ways we incorrectly travel narratively and practically. Yeah. I mean, I love that you brought it up too in that context. I'm just recalling actually to a, it was pretty clever advertisement. I mean, at least it was shown up here. Uh, I think it was like an insurance, you know, the local insurance um, uh, ad, but it was basically showing people walking uh, yeah. in the same fashion as they would drive, like in the sense of tailing. Right. Oh, yeah. Uh, so they, they would show like, you know, a couple walking and like somebody right behind them kind of like, come on, get going out of the way. Like uh, and just how obviously ridiculous that behavior is when you're walking, but how normal it is when you're driving. Right. When there's a sense of I got place to be, get out of the way. Yeah. There's a certain inherent domination energy right within these large vehicles that moving at a high speed um, that yeah, is built right into that experience. And. You know, I just last thing to say, too, I mean, of course, even biking, I think is is there's a difference between uh, uh, this is Stephen Jenkinson, again, speaking about this idea of a machine and a tool. Yeah. And for me, they're just so significant, actually, how distinguished they are, because if you think about it, you might say, well, a bicycle is basically like a pre pre car. Yeah. Right. Like a proto car. And uh and, and then because it, it all inevitably leads to like a car and then maybe, I don't know, supersonic jet or something. But uh, he, he'll make the case that a tool continues to resemble a relationship to humanness, right? Like you think of a screwdriver. It's like, you know, it's pretty close to, you know, using your hand to like, you know, shift a bolt or something uh, or a hammer. It's just like your hand, but like harder, right? But it, there's a certain human limitation built into its usage. Right. Yeah. Like you can just you can just hammer forever. Right. Let's say you get tired. So there's a kind of built in mercy with that. Right. To say, OK, these these tools will do a little bit further. Right. Than what we could do just on our own. I think a bicycle is the same, actually. Like a bicycle, I mean, electric bike, you might be skirting the, the line there. But yeah. a bicycle is, you know, pedaled by you and it's human bound still, even though it's yeah. supporting. Right. And, and you move at a pace, though, you can still smell things. Right. You can still you know, catch glimpses of uh, what you're passing by, like the pace to me generally, you know, is, is at a way that's still possible, I think, to be in some kind of sensual, right, relationship to place. Whereas as soon as you get to car, right, it's just boom, it's you're in a whole other bubble, right, and just just ripping through. So I just think that's important also to name. Yeah, it's it's interesting. Yeah, the, the, the bike is still using your body, still activating your whole organism in a way that you know you can't avoid and the car is is one level abstracted from that like you're barely embodied in it um so you so you of course don't take responsibility for your body which is this extended apparatus um it's an interesting idea um huh okay well i also have one question that doesn't quite fit in here but i do think it'd be important to maybe end on it which is your father I, you know, my my exploration into the masculine began as someone who, you know, had had a miscarriage and had had a strong sense that it was a, a, a son 
and then was like, I would like to have a son someday. And what would that mean? I would probably have to actually do some hard work to think about how I could model a healthy masculine to that child. And I'm wondering what that inquiry has looked like in your life. Mm -hmm. Of how to model yeah. fatherhood in a way. Or, 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 or how you're exploring this, how you're thinking about it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it's sort of well known within you know men's work yeah. circles and, and process that you know part of the main work essentially is to yeah be aware of your own shadow yeah right? I mean, any any kind of personal growth you know stuff you know that tends to come up that's important for one because um, of course you know you can't see typically what's in your shadow I mean from a Jungian understanding and so you need others to help point that out right and you need like discipline and practice. To, to work on that because then you won't ideally put so much of that unconsciously on your children in this case you know on your son yeah. another key piece is uh is a lot of father work right for for fathers especially because again those things that you don't integrate or, or are unaware of it's very easy to pass those things on intergenerationally um to your children and then just continue the cycle yeah so so for me i mean that's really the the kind of operating understanding is yeah where where am i unconscious where am i blind you know where am i um not cultivating a kind of relationship or, or maybe what is the relationship i want to have with my son right and what didn't i get from my father as well um for all the limitations right and all the ways that he wasn't you know held within yeah. a group of men that that were doing this kind of work you know just for starters right which i think is part of the like architecture of um like what's i guess what i'm trying to say is I've, I don't believe the individual can, quote, heal alone, right? Like, it's it's just very clear that there's a limitation um, there and that not only can't you heal alone, but you, you don't want to because it doesn't give anywhere for culture to show up, yeah. right? Because, you know, the heroic ideal means basically that you don't need anybody else. And, uh, and then, but therefore, then there's no village, there's no culture. And so mm -hmm. one of the smartest things that you could do, I think, for a father and that I've really tried to do is continually surround myself with other men and other fathers, also mm -hmm. endeavoring right on this path yeah. to really lean into, yeah, what does it mean to father? Like, how, how have you been showing up? You know, in my uh, father's group, actually, which just completed um, in the town I moved from, you know, we, we often started this question, uh, you know, share a, a win and a woe right from from fathering this past week yeah. and we would say okay well this was you know it was a win but this was a woe you know this is something maybe i'm not proud of this is how yeah. i showed up and so it's this constant feedback process right of of others in a in a kind of compassionate um way to bring a level of of standard um and and in this learning because yeah i don't actually think you know there's modeling fatherhood and there's there's learning it learning. Um, as a as an inquiry as a discipline yeah and i don't i just think it's not it's not inherently available, I think, especially when we don't have that many great father uh, models in a, in a cultureless time. So, yeah. you know, this is this is the level of inquiry that I've been in with my son. And, and of course, it's changing now. He's four, you know, we're just starting him in soccer, for example. And, you know, I was big into soccer when I was young. And so immediately, I feel a sense of, oh, I could be, you know, useful here, I could build relationship with him here in this shared passion for this sport as well. So the finding these touch points as the age changes too is uh, really helpful. Well, that's very sensitive. It also sounds like you have this group where you can make contact as you were talking about earlier, where you can make contact with other fathers. So it's not happening in isolation. Um, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Might, have been, might have been bio too, actually. Yeah, bio said something like, I think it was like fatherhood is a community endeavor something like that and uh, yeah it has to be um i mean i i look i go down to the river every day where i live and watch these male ducks corral all mutually corral their like their little kin <laughs> and then it's like a totally like like i've been thinking a lot about a, a mallard ducks male mallard ducks as being like very fatherly creatures um, <laughs> they never do it alone it's always a kind of bumptious hilarious um, antic experience yeah well that's okay. a, yeah maybe or yeah maybe just to say too that i do think that there is a yeah what is the function of fatherhood too right i often yeah. wonder about versus an identity because yeah. sometimes it is able to you know you can uh it's distinguish the, inside the nominal instead of like burbing it yeah yeah so what is the function of fatherhood you know and i i, I just again depending on the context but i really feel like there's something around inviting um a child and you know i don't have a daughter so i don't have that kind of experience but at least for my son like consciously inviting in more 
uh, I don't know if risk is quite the right word at this age, but essentially, you know, pushing the bounds of his own explorations, you know, in a way that um, brings enough challenge, you know, but also compassion um, seems to be some function of fathering, right? Whereas um, mothering, or at least the maternal archetype as the place of, you know, nourishment, safety, um, that kind of womb cocoon, you know, energy is, is also vital, obviously. And, you know, it, I think it's vital also to tap into a masculine nurturance as well um, is really important. But yeah. I do think that there is an art to that sense of, yeah, inviting a child into more and more challenge. Uh, so they, they become able to, to know themselves right in relation to, uh, to other things and other beings. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm just leaning into that place as he's getting even more, you know, explorative and, and bold in his way. Thank you for sharing, Ian. Is there anything you would like to end with? Is there a myth or a story? Would you like to tell us about your school of mythopoetics? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. I mean, certainly I'd love to mention the school of mythopoetics, yeah. which actually grew out of the Mythic Masculine Network, which is actually an initial community I created around the podcast because people were asking, hey, what, you know, what, how do I learn more? How do I tap into what, you know, your folks are talking about? And so the school emerged with collaboration with a few others uh, that has essentially been this fertile soil for these kinds of inquiries, yeah. uh, as well as just um, really being in like an initiation container. And by that meaning, uh, like how to bring out uh, a sense of embedment, which is another term from Tamara, which I didn't talk mm -hmm. about this time, but uh, and contact around others who are also, you know, trying to make sense mythically of what is going on in their own lives and collectively. Mm -hmm. So it's a beautiful place to, to, you know, mingle with folks like that. And uh, I just want to mention next weekend, like, so not this weekend, but the next one, we have a two day beautiful ritual for Samhain happening uh, with some, you know, international storytellers, musicians and poets. Uh, it's called Into the Dark, which uh, you're all invited to come attend as well, which um, is built upon a, a sort of weaving uh, of a former format, which I called a gathering of stories, uh, which is ultimately, you know, not, it's not so much a conference, but it's more of a ceremony. It's a, yeah. it's a ceremony of story and myth and magic that uh, they're just really special. And so if folks are interested, yeah, you can find it at schoolmythopoetics.com. Well, thank you so much for coming today. This has, as always, been very lovely. Um, mm. And yeah, I really look forward to seeing what else emerges from the School of Mythopoetics. I definitely feel like you are a master gardener that you never focus on one species. You're very good at weaving in a mycelial way, many different perspectives together. Um, so thank you for that, Ian. Mm. Um, Thanks, Sophie. Okay, yeah, maybe I will end with saying that, you know, we will be exploring these biodiversity of mythic and biological and mythobiological perspectives in the rewilding mythology course. We have a bunch of different speakers. Um, our first two speakers will be Elnor Lada and David Abram on November 7th. So if you want to tune into that, you can sign up at www.rewildingmythology.com. Um, yeah. Thank you. Everyone. I'm glad you're talking to Eleanor as well. He's a close friend as well. And uh, He's yeah, amazing. Really speaker. So yeah, mm -hmm. that'll be good. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you everyone. Have a lovely, lovely day. And um, as always come bother me if you have, further thoughts about this conversation. <laughs> Ian, thank you. Mm, thanks, Sophie.